bit smaller. Um, okay, so so something that I want to say about properties like like this, I'm writing them, but they are all trivial. Uh, they're all trivial if you just think of the mass dimension and invariance, covariance with respect to the uh, SL2C indices and little group indices, then they're trivial up to science. So the only non-trivial part in all of these things are the consistency, uh, the consistent signs between, say, this equation and this equation. And the signs, these are just signs, right? They, they uh, now we have two types of, uh, three types of indices, all of which are contracted with levi civitas So you have three sources for uh, plus minus ones. Uh, so this is why uh, uh, I'm, I'm just showing them to you now. Uh, for example, this equation, PA, PB contracted, right? It has to be, it doesn't have any indices, uh, any SL2C indices, it only has a and B indices. Of course, it has to be anti-symmetric with respect to them because they were contracted using an SL2C Levi-Civita in the first place. So it has to be proportional to Levi-Civita. And by mass dimension, it has to be proportional to an M. So the only non-trivial thing is that there's a minus here uh, and angle brackets and, and square brackets have a, a, a minus between them. You see, otherwise, it's really, you, you could have written them, uh, you can read them something like that uh, right away. Uh, so the source for the signs is, uh, well, th this was the starting point that uh, just now written in angles in, in square brackets. Um, if you take its determinant, uh, the determinant here gives you m squared. Uh, the determinant here, see it's a two by two matrix and two by two matrix, matrices. It's a convention to say that determinant of lambda p a alpha equals to determinant lambda tilde p alpha dot a equals m. Right? I could have put a minus here and that would flip all other signs in front of m. But it's just a convention. Uh, great. So another convention uh, that might be useful is this. So whenever we flip a momentum, we get a minus in front of angle brackets, and nothing happens to uh, square brackets. So this is consistency. There's consistency between this equation or this equation and that. The, uh, only one of them has to split a sign, or another convention would be to put i here and in here. Uh, so uh, the specific implementation that I tend to use uh, that's uh, like documented in uh, 1802 in the appendix of V3 of that paper. It respects that, and on top of that, it respects uh, the conjugation property. So that uh, has not been uh, discussed before, but uh, it might be good to have a conjugation property. Uh, Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, one uh, message here is that, well, in the exercise, I, I, I told you to 
to show that uh, inverse, to, that lowering little group indices and raising them corresponds to, in, uh, to inverted SU2 transformations, which is, uh, which is uh, Hermitian conjugation. Therefore, it's consistent, at least consistent, but it's, it's logical that uh, conju conjugating little group indices puts them down. So there's, there's consistency between this convention and the fact that, uh, uh, and, and, the, and, and the property of SU2. Uh, very good. Okay. Actually, yeah, let, let me, uh, let me prove this out of the definitions that, uh, that I have, just to show you how, how these things uh, are proven. Well, let me put a C here for convenience. So, great. So this P here, I, I can rewrite it in this in this way. Alpha A A B B beta dot and let me lower this index. Uh, gamma Now, this part, uh, C. So this part is contracted with uh, Alevi Chivita on SL2 soup, SL2C part, so it has to be proportional. Uh, so it's anti-symmetric in the SU2 part as well. So B and C, B and C uh, indices uh, have, to be, have to come in Alevi Chivita form. And the coefficient in front of it will be a contraction of these things. Uh, uh, lambda tilde tilde yeah. d e. And this thing, again, is a uh, determinant. So what we get here is M B C. So this Levitivita B C with Levitivita A B gives you a Kronecker. So all you get is M lambda uh, alpha C. So I use the the definition here for the uh, uh, for the factorization, and I use the convention for the determinant. That's why the sign here is M. Uh, great. So now I want to. That, that's it for the building blocks. I don't want to uh, discuss uh, discuss them as building blocks anymore. I want to start using them for something. Uh, if there's any questions at this point, uh, please uh, please ask them. Sorry. Yeah. Um, can you maybe make clear what is the main difference to just the max speed off? Because you use two wide speed offs, right? And you define them such that the product with the masses look quite similar to the Dirac spin. Yeah. Uh, so my next step will be to construct Dirac spinners out of the spinners, and. Okay. Yeah, but uh, well, Dirac spinners package these, uh, but we will be using this not for just Dirac spinners. Um, great. Uh, oh. So, in, if you. Recall when you first have heard about uh, spin, quantum spin, 
That was probably with respect to electrons. So massive Dirac spinners, indeed. So let's uh, let's do something. Let's do some simple physics uh, using th these tools for Dirac spinners. Um, well, uh, there are different representations for Dirac spinners, but uh, let's uh, use the one in which gamma matrices are written in terms of the sigma matrices. Uh, so that there are these indices here, like so. Uh, gamma 5 then becomes uh, minus 1, 1. This is why, so the upper part here acts on, so this is one which is actually a Kronecker with respect to something like alpha beta and Kronecker with respect to alpha, uh, alpha no, actually, I think it's the opposite. Alpha beta and alpha dot beta dot. Okay, so this is why I, I call, I should be calling angle spinners antichiral, uh, like chirality minus, and uh, square spinners uh, uh, to be chirality plus. Uh, and let, let us define Dirac spinners now. Well, I can cook, cook them up uh, in this way now. And uh, the Dirac spinner for V, uh, for, for the opposite sign of mass, I can define as a com as that for the uh, just flipping the momentum, basically using uh, this upper property. So it's uh, an exercise of just using all of these properties uh, in a, like four by four setting uh, to show that then I have all everything that I like about uh, the rack spinners. So I have Dirac equation, uh, just following that other Dirac equation in, in the two by two setting. They are properly normalized and complete in the spin, in the spin, spin space. Uh, so this is like a completeness uh, relation with respect to spins. This is uh, how to get the momentum out, and this is the normalization. Oh, no, no, the, yeah, this is, this is the completeness relation that sits, this, this is something that would appear in a pro propagator enumerator, uh, naturally, through unitarity, if you have a cut line like this, you get a propagator, uh, uh, propagator numerator for the Dirac spinner. Okay, so all of these just follow. Uh, we use our building blocks to uh, construct our uh, Dirac spinners. Uh, and finally, yeah, there's a conjugation property that uh, for that convention works like so. Great. Now, okay, I, I said that, uh, why am I doing that? I said that, uh, well, Jake's, Jake's approach was to kind of forget about Q of T. I want to be more friendly, right? I want to use uh, the building blocks that we like in amplitudes, but to connect them to the usual Q of T uh, framework, uh, just to show that the, uh, there's no contradiction. You can just take those variables 
plug them in and still get something out of the usual key of t approaches. Uh, and uh, you, yeah, you, you get nicer, nicer formulas. Um, actually, yeah, what am I doing? So let's, uh, let's do the simplest exercise possible. Let's compute a three-point amplitude for an old-fashioned Dirac spinner. Uh, well, let's do it in QCD. So just for the, uh, if, if this is uh, the covariant derivative with respect to some gluonic field, uh, the, the ver vertex becomes this. Uh, C J. Come on, me. So this is the joint color index C, fundamental indices I and J. Uh, yeah, and they're implicit uh, spinning indices here, Dirac, Dirac uh, spinning indices. Yeah, square root of two is the usual convention that we like, where the trace of these guys is just A, B. Great. Uh, so compute. A, B. So I will now I have many indices, so let me write all the spin indices upstairs and the color indices downstairs. So don't confuse the C with a with little group indices. Um, so this is just v1 bar uh, a as defined as defined here with uh, with a flipped momentum uh, and yeah, the, the, the last piece is the polarization vector. Uh, Q3, Q2, Q3. So this is OK. So if you were looking at an old-fashioned textbook, that would be the answer. Just written in terms of V, gamma mu, U, and, and polarization vector. You wouldn't go past that. But now we, we, we know something more about the, uh, the constituent blocks here. So let's, uh, let's compute. Um, So, uh, there, of course, you probably all know, but let me draw these relations here, that this is, that contracting two sigma matrices spits you out uh, th this spinner combination uh, with a factor of two and the same and a very similar property goes for this. So there's, there were two factors of two, uh, square root of two. They canceled with that two. And now we can just write what we get. This gets contracted here. And it gets contracted here with a mu index. So you, we, we get Q. The next index that goes is this 3. And then it gets constructed here. Uh, and the other bit is 1 gets contracted here. This mu is contracted here. And there's a 3 that gets out of there. And it gets contracted up, up there. 
Now, OK, the, it, it's an answer. But at this point, we still have a dependence on Q. This Q is a reference, uh, massless reference momentum that you have to usually use to introduce uh, polarization vectors in the massless spinning helicity. Since we're using Q of t, we had to introduce it somehow. But we are using spinning helicity after all, so we have to be able to get rid of it somehow. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's do our best. Um, so let me write that part as, oh wait, yeah, there was no m here before, but now let me cook up a momentum, uh, an extra momentum, well, I choose to cook up a momentum here, so P2. And here, I choose to cook up a momentum here. So Q to B. Uh, OK, so this comes with a minus, because uh, I cooked it up here, and that property there has a minus. Uh, here, I cooked it up here, so that probably doesn't have a minus. Now, I want to rewrite that as minus P1 minus P3, where, of course, 3 goes away because it acts on a massless spinner. So, uh, in fact, I have, oh, this is Q. Yeah. Uh, so, in fact, I can rewrite that as uh, minus 1q, 2b, 1, uh, p1, 3. OK? So this bit and this bit, uh, they naturally uh, combine into a Schouten identity. So it becomes plus 1 over m, uh, 2b, 1a, q, P13. Okay. So I've just rewritten it. Well, it's there's still Q present, but let me write it with this factor. This I define this factor to be this. Q P13. Uh, square root of, no, yeah, just 3q. Now, I claim that this uh, helicity factor is a gauge invariant on the three-point kinematics. Uh, well, before that, let me, uh, let, I will be calling it a helicity factor because it has a plus helicity. It is actually uh, just minus uh, square root of 2 over m p1 dot epsilon plus. So it naturally contains a helicity for the particle, for, uh, for particle 3. Um, uh, then uh, it doesn't have any helicity with respect to q. And uh, yeah, p1 is just contracted here. Great. Ah, it, it doesn't have any mass dimension. So it's a pure phase factor. Now, uh, on three-point kinematics, p squared, uh, p2 squared is on shell. Uh, p2 is on shell, so p2 squared equals m squared. Uh, by momentum conservation, this is uh, 2 p1 p3. Which is 3, 1, 3. Well, yeah, I call it just one here. So, that's, so this is a spinner. After you contract a spinner with, an, with a matrix, it's still some kind of spinner. Uh, it's contracted with three, and it gives you zero. Well, definitely, this one three has to be proportional to three. 
Otherwise, this, this wouldn't be the case. As a vector, as a two-dimensional vector, it's proportional. There's some pr proportionality constant, and I define it to be minus m x3. So this x3 is really just a, a pr proportionality constant following from the on-shell condition. And this proportionality constant here does not depend on any reference momentum. You can just multiply it by any q on the left side and give this, get this form. But it can be anything. Uh, so therefore, this form, uh, it's not only compact, but it's also gauge invariant. Uh, as opposed to whatever, like, would be written here, it, it is called gauge invariant, but it's much less obvious. Um, well, at least I claim. Maybe it, it's, quite, it's quite obvious as well, actually, if you just use the momentum, uh, the Dirac equation. Um, but at least uh, if you imagine computing it uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a mathematical routine, the amount of contractions you will have to do in this equation, and this equation analytic, uh, analytically or numerically will be much, much smaller. Uh, and uh, a similar calculation, uh, so my starting point was here, the end point was there, and a similar cal calculation for the other helicity minus would give uh, minus IG TCIG X3, 1 over X3. Mm. What should I be raising? So at this point, I have introduced enough, uh, um, enough equations to go on. But let me uh, highlight something important here. Uh, well, th these equations here tell us that unlike the uh, massless case, we can always trade uh, Antichiral spinners for chiral spinners and vice versa. There's always, you, you can always trade them, just one for the other. And in, here, I wrote one amplitude in, in, uh, in one basis and the other one in another basis. So I, I could actually have uh, done el something else. So for that, on three points, let, let me write some equations that hold on three points. In fact, on three points, um, there's a minus here. Oh, by the way, I take all the momentum incoming, if you haven't noticed. Uh, but yeah, why not? Yeah, it's easy to show, like this works, for example, that you, you can cook up a momentum uh, one here, and then uh, remind yourself that this was uh, minus m x33, and you, you, you get this. Easy. Uh, therefore, this. Uh, This amplitude here 
could just as well be written in this slightly longer form. So, um, oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, let me switch gears and say something more general and then, uh, um, and, and then deal with the consequences. So in fact, so we've been considering this kinematics and three, on three points, two masses, uh, non-zero and equal and the other one zero. So the most general amplitude that you could write uh, for this particle, well, you have to have some helicity here. And uh, watch me. So let me just state that for the moment. The consider spin S particle S1 particle here and S2 particle there. The, I claim that the indices that you need to use here will be 2S fully symmetric indices. Uh, little group indices and uh, so S1 and S2 they can be different and the most general thing that you can possibly write in the angle uh, in the angle brackets uh, would be some expansion the expansion would involve some number of these objects, some number of these objects, and well, at this point, all our indices for one and two are paired. So if, if, if S1 and S2 are different, then there's also objects like this uh, that can enter. Uh, and these objects will have to, so these enters, uh, these guys enter when S1 is bigger than S2, this enters as when S2 is smaller than S1, oh, uh, no, S1 is smaller than S2. Um, Oh, S1 are those are spins of uh, quantum, uh, total quantum spins of uh, particles one and two. So, so far I've been talking about spin one half, and spin one half is consistent with what I just said because I only use one index. At two, S, two, S, uh, two halves is just one. I only needed one index for a Dirac spinner uh, to, to uh, describe its spin. Now I have uh, some general spin. I claim that I'm, I have to use much more indices. They will be all sym symmetrized. So I will be writing uh, symmetrized tensor products. So this is just symmetrized tensor product. And uh, well, I will be summing over different combinations of this form, uh, 
if you think a little bit, the most general thing that you can write will go in this way. So I, I will be summing up over R. This R will go depending on the spins. There will be some constants here, but everything else is fixed by, uh, by, by little group covariance and uh, uh, SL2C invariance. Plus R and by uh, mass dimension. So this is just to preserve the right mass dimension. Uh, S1 plus S2 minus R. R minus S1 minus S2. This is absolute value. And OK. So you see, uh, so I, I, at the moment, I haven't introduced, uh, uh, I, I have really accelerated very much. But I want just to show you that uh, whatever I have written there, when I was using it in a very familiar setting, can be applied to a mu much more general setting uh, for general spin amplitudes. And it's really just uh, uh, covariant properties. And the real reason why, uh, uh, why this is the massive spinning helicity that you should be using is that indeed the covariance with respect to the little group allows you to do that. Um, if you're b before that, people were not using the, f the full uh, SU2 covariance. Uh, that's why uh, they, they were not writing that yet. Maybe ac actually, I, I think that maybe in the 60s there were formulas that could be translated to that, but. Uh, I don't think they, uh, they caught on that much. Uh, OK. So let me now, again, slow down and uh, try to explain on a simple example why something like that would make sense. Actually, how, how am I doing on time? Oh, uh, should I be stopping? No, no. Oh, OK. Great. Uh, so. Uh, well, I've introduced some, some symmetrization over, uh, over little group indices. And there was nothing like that in the Dirac spinner case because there was nothing to symmetrize over. There was just one index. In the Scaly case, of course, there's nothing to symmetrize. So let, let's consider the first non-trivial symmetrization case is massive spin 1. Uh, so massive spin 1 is described by a Proca Lagrangian. Uh, let me remind you, uh, what, what is the sign here? Looks like this, where this is just a field strength uh, version of V. Uh, so this is, a ve this is a vector field. Uh, its equation of motion is uh, this, which, oh wait, there's a mass, minus. So from this, you see that it gives a standard on-shell relation. And it gives you that V must be transverse. OK? So the transversality is just given by differentiating it again. This is anti-symmetric. So it vanishes, and therefore, this divergent has to be 0. Great. Uh, so if you want to quantize this thing, you want to introduce some polarization, well, wave functions that are vectors. Again, uh, in Q of t, you have to deal with this, uh, uh, this off-shell index. And I claim that there are two indices that I need to, uh, to use now for the little group. And uh, a uh, sensible way to get them well, it's low index, is to just take a, a, uh, an angle spinner and a, uh, and a square spinner and symmetrize and uh, preserve the mass dimension. 
Yeah. S1 is bigger than S2, therefore the, this power makes sense. Oh, then the, this just goes away. Yeah, it doesn't. It's a trivial case. Yeah, I was uh, I was looking at the case where these S's are the same, and actually I will only be looking at the cases where they're the same. I, I only wrote that for uh, like to be more general than I want to be. But you see, for, I mean, this thing I wrote here is just because everything can be traded for this bracket, this bracket, and this bracket. And that, that's it. And everything else is, must be, does, does, cannot have any little group indices, so it has, to, but it still has some helicity weight with respect to the massless particle. So you have to be careful that every time you get a three here, you have to account for it by introducing an extra helicity factor. But otherwise, uh, this is really fixed. The only unfixed coefficients here are this g, are this coupling constants. And uh, in, the, in the Dirac case, one of them, is uh, both of them are fixed to the same uh, QCD coupling constant uh, up to some minus. Right, so I've just introduced that. Uh, and the first thing you can, you can check is that it's transverse. Well, this is obvious to check. Uh, here it gives you angle bracket with an M, and backwards it gives you a square bracket with minus M, and then you, I, I, in other way, you sym symmetrize it, but wh what it gives you is a Levitch Vita, so, uh, uh, so nothing happens. Oh, was it too fast? D does everyone see the trans transversality now from the, uh, Well, uh, everybody say yes. Well, not everybody said yes, so let me write that. Now everybody can see it. Um, And uh, well, some non-trivial things that you can also check is just the normalization. Uh, it's space-like, so the normalization here is like that. But what it really means is just that epsilon one one. Uh, 1, 1 equals minus 1. Uh, so, and, and as I uh, introduced before, lower indices means complex conjugation. So this is what you would write in the old-fashioned notation. There is a non-trivial factor of 2 here, uh, minus 1 half. Uh, so the so, so this would correspond to uh, polarization uh, plus one, say plus one. This correspond to a polarization zero. So it's normalized slightly differently, but that's fine because whenever you have uh, something uh, SU2 covariant, you would have to contract them like this, uh, which I, let, let me do it, uh, mu nu. And what you get here is important because this is the completeness relation that lives in the massive vector propagator. But what, the point here is that when you, when you have a sum like this, you always have this thing twice, just because you sum over a, both a and b going from one to two. So this factor of two makes sense when you want to construct nice uh, uh, nice contractions. And uh, yeah, uh, something that I already said in words.
So just, just as for the Dirac spinners, I could cook up some uh, Dirac fermions, I could cook up some wave functions that I can feed into my QFT. I can cook up, uh, in the vector case, I could cook, can cook up some polarization, massive polarization vectors and uh, proceed in the usual way with my QFT. And, uh, well, here there were just two indices. In general, um, in general, uh, imagine that you have indices, 2S indices. Oh, this is. They are all symmetric. So whatever you can do here is just add ones and twos. If you, uh, if you start with uh, only ones, you can add a two. Add it at the end, it doesn't matter where. Add it uh, at two twos and do it until you have only twos everywhere. You can do it only 2s uh, minus one times. Uh, oh. What did I say? Yeah, plus one. Uh, and in this way, uh, you can you can relate uh, the just the uh, ones and twos in the SL2C uh, SU2 indices to helicities, but they are not really helicities. Well, they can be helic helicities if you take your quantization axis to be the momentum, but uh, let maybe let me call it polarizations. I don't know. Uh, let me call it H still. So let, imagine that this is plus S, then this is S minus one, S minus two, and all the way un, until minus S. Um, and SU, the, the SU2 corresponds to the rotation of the quantization axis. Great, uh, yeah, I, I can make this claim more concrete uh, for integer spins. Uh, Uh, for integer spins, uh, I would have to cook up some moment, uh, some some wave function uh, with S Lorentz indices and two S uh, little group indices, and the way to do it is just to take my spin one guy. Uh, take. S of them, 2s minus 1, 2s, and symmetrize over all of them. Um, and uh, using that notation that I used upstairs, I can just write it as the s power of, uh, of the spin 1 guy. I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean here by degrees of freedom. Uh, well, there's a fixed momentum. Uh, then, oh, 
Oh, well, here uh, I created three distinct uh, polarization vectors. They are distinct. They, they came out of the same uh, building blocks that I used for, uh, that are used for the Dirac spinner. So is that uh, anything uh, weird to you? Actually, yeah, in, in Q of T, the degrees of freedom uh, also come from uh, having different uh, creation and annihilation operators. For example, if you have a, a Dirac spinner, you write it, the, the free field, you write it something like this, and then you write U of P, A, and a creation, uh, annihilation operator A, P, A, plus And if it's a Dirac spinner, you use a different operator here. P uh, A V P. Okay? If it's a Majorana spinner, has half degrees of freedom, you just put an A cross here. So uh, you can always double degrees of freedom by, con uh, by considering uh, complex fields instead of real fields. Is, does that relate to? Uh, so degrees of freedom not only live in, in, in those things. There's also the P that is another degree of freedom, that is another label that is, um, uh, that is continuous. Uh, great. And uh, maybe, yeah, I still have, oh. Well, si since I was uh, talking about massive spin one, uh, let me make an interesting remark that uh, I guess is important to make. Uh, so if you take the vertex that gets, uh, if, if you cu couple it to, uh, if you couple it to a gauge field, and you just replace these uh, derivatives by covariant derivatives, you will get a vertex. At the same time, if you take the vertex from uh, the standard model, as if it was a W boson that comes from the spontaneous symmetry, symmetry breaking of, uh, well, gauge SU2. Not, not little group SU2, but a gauge SU2. Then you get a vert another vertex. Uh, and the vertex that you get for the gauge SU2, uh, for, for, for the W bosons, uh, well, let me draw them slightly differently from direct spinners. Uh, I don't know. like that. So this is lambda uh, mu nu. So it will look just the same. Uh, it will be very similar to the gluonic vertex, just because it came from Yam Mills. We'll have stuff like that. Um, so let me say one. To three lambda mu nu, then it becomes p one lambda. Well, I'm just. This is the gluonic vertex. So it's different from the vertex that you would get just by uh, extended derivatives. And from this vertex, uh, from the standard model vertex, you will get uh, amplitudes of this form. 
A123 plus. will be x3, 1, 2, 2, with some g. OK. So in the next uh, lecture, I will be talking about uh, the more general concept that is in the setting of spin s, where only one of the of this big sum survives, and that corresponds to what uh, uh, a, Nimar Kanehamet and Tu Huangs called minimal coupling, and that's something that corresponds to what uh, we use for black holes. So this minimal coupling that they defined in this little group sense, uh, it, it corresponds to things like that, just uh, brackets to some power. Uh, for the plus helicity of the, of the gauge uh, boson, you, you get angle brackets to some power. And uh, for the other case, you get uh, square brackets to some power. So it's just one term of this huge thing. Uh, and in the, already in the case of mass of spin one, it corresponds to this vertex, which is not the minimal coupling in the, uh, in the uh, uh, covariant derivative sense. So there is uh, still this problem now. Nobody has, uh, you, have to say, you have to say now minimal coupling in which sense? In the, in the minimal little group sense or the uh, or the covariant derivative sense, uh, now that they're, they're two similar, uh, similar notions. And for the Dirac spinner, that wasn't an issue because it was the minimal coupled Lagrangian, and it gave, gave us uh, the amplitudes that correspond to the minimal coupling. So the minimal coupling would, in general, be 2s here, and some h minus h. Okay. Uh, yeah, plus h. Okay, well, thanks for your attention.